Okay, good afternoon everyone. Now that the meeting's called to order, we're going to get started. The first order of business is the signing of the contract with uh, Local 1540. The union representatives uh, came in earlier today, and so I'm going to pass these over to my left uh, and have, uh, there are six copies, so each of you has to sign all six copies. Um, does anyone mind if we continue on with the rest of the agenda as the signing happens? You guys pass those around. Why don't we bring up uh, Andrew Sargent and Dr. Matiri? Matare, sorry. And they're going to give us an update on the business incubator. <laughs> No, no doubt. <laughs> sure. Ah, good evening. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Matari and I would like to give you a, a, a midterm update on the, uh, the some of the progress of the uh, the business incubator that <coughs> incubator that we're uh, uh, forming downtown. Uh, your memo says that we've we've been calling it the uh, the e collider or entrepreneurial collider. It's kind of a a, a buzz phrase in the in the in the uh, the uh, incubator business, where where businesses uh, resources and businesses and the people looking to, to provide and start businesses uh, kind of collide. And the idea is kind of uh, you, you you try to uh, <laughs> uh, you try to force the interaction between the two, and people then learn and grow from each other. So that's kind of where we are on the naming of this at this point. But. Uh, a traditional incubator uh, facility links resident businesses that pay a reduced rental rate uh, to the resources such as marketing assistance and networking, financial planning advice, and things like that. Uh, we have taken this incubator idea and incorporated that, but also since the current rental rates in downtown Hagerstown are already fairly uh, low, that we want to be also a business resource center to existing businesses in the downtown or others that are thinking about moving into the downtown. So while we do intend on, uh, on incubating some businesses in place under roof, we also want to be a business resource center for everybody who's already out there. Uh, because rental rates are so low, there are some businesses that, that it's very, the, the barrier to entering, uh, entering the marketplace is low also. So we want to try to ensure their success with this business resource center or entrepreneurial uh, 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 collider. So. Uh, in your memo packet, there is a, uh, a stab at the, the first draft of the, it's actually in the back of your, I think, it, I don't know how they printed it out for you, but a, a stab at the, uh, the first draw, drawing layouts of the, of the uh, center. And you'll see a big uh, business accelerator room in the middle surrounded by uh, other resources. Uh, we, we're we're fine-tuning this. As a matter of fact, just yesterday we had a st our steering committee met for the first time. Uh, we've assembled a steering committee of local stakeholders and partners uh, to help guide us through this. Uh, we're looking at things like staffing, how we could accomplish some staffing of the facility, uh, how we uh, uh, program the facility, and, uh, and out of these discussions are, are coming some modifications of this plan. But this general plan is what we're going to, is, is, is sort of what we're looking at with a business acceleration room in the middle where all sorts of things can happen. That room can be set up in many different ways uh, with modular tables and, uh, and, and things of that nature to do trainings, to do seminars, to, do, uh, to have hangouts and, 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 and just kind of uh, business discussion sessions. Uh, there'll be a couple offices. It's anticipated that uh, SCORE and SBTDC, the two uh, free of charge business uh, consulting services, would be able to, would, uh, SCORE might actually have a physical office here. But the, both those organizations could hold workshops, trainings, seminars in this center, uh, bringing those people who are looking for resources into an area where there are even greater resources for them to use. And, uh, and it's possible that we'll, we might have a small uh, retail incubator space and possibly another small uh, office uh, incubator space also. Reception area and then a business resource center where people can come in and uh, and be fairly guided on, you know, setting up an LLC or, or, or uh, assistance in marketing, some of these things that businesses need as they, as they start. Uh, one of our strong partners in this has been uh, Dr. Matari and, and, and FSU. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Matari, well, why don't I let you talk a little bit about your, your certificate class. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here today. 
Speak you, into the microphone, okay, please. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, you all may know that Frostburg State has a business <clears throat> program here at USMH, and part of that is a concentration in entrepreneurship. And we do uh, graduate a growing number of students from that program. One of the things they do before they graduate is take a course on writing a business plan. And some of them actually go out there and, and execute their business and, and start it. So it's very exciting to see that. And um, I've been working with Andrew on this because part of the concept here is to draw upon that student population and give them an opportunity to work in an environment where businesses are getting started and they can work as interns, um, which we're thinking would be something really helpful to have uh, students there as interns and help uh, manage some of the details, the day-to-day -day, uh, issue, you know, kinds of things around the incubator. On top of the entrepreneurship program, later this fall, we're going to offer our first certificate program, which will be in entrepreneurial leadership. And that will be for people who are either starting a business or are in business. And that's something that we visualize offering an, at the incubator, the e-collider. So um, there's a lot of synergy with the university and the entrepreneurship program and then the plans that are underway for this uh, incubator. And we're really looking forward to working with uh, the city and uh, taking this further down the road. We're, we're also lucky we have uh, Lori Spesser from HCC, uh, teaches in the business program out there, has just shown a need for, when her students come out, that you know it's difficult to point them in any one place to, to, to kind of mm -hmm. continue their education and continue to get them set up. Uh, she's very positive mm -hmm. about how this would how this would be helpful to the downtown and to our to our small business community, uh, frankly. Uh, we had our, like I said, we had our first steering committee meeting yesterday. And the brainstorming that comes out of things like that is, is really pretty cool. I mean, we uh, uh, have a, a local entrepreneur saying, hey, you know, why don't, how about every Thursday morning, I, I, uh, for, for a couple months, I, do a, I just have an open discussion about, about risk, investment mm -hmm. risk, you know, for your business. And, and then people kind of start coming up with other programs and expertise rise to the top. And these are the things we're gonna, we'd harness and start programming in, into the center itself. Dr. Matari? Matari? Yes. What, I'm curious, what do your students say about business in downtown or opening a business in downtown? What are some, what is some of the feedback that you hear from your students? Um, well, uh, what's interesting is one, in one of my classes, the first night of class, I send them out onto the streets and walk around. And the idea, the assignment is to come back with business ideas. And they do this in teams. And um, they're all very excited about the opportunities, I mean, some of them are more visible than others, but, um, you know, some really nice things are, are happening, too. But they come back with really interesting ideas, like we've had a daycare center uh, business concept, a pet sitting and pet daycare. Mm -hmm. uh, people can drop their pets off when they come to work. Lots of restaurants, you know, those kinds of things. So they, they get very excited about that. I was so, just curious. Being yeah, an educator yeah. myself, I'm always interested in hearing what the younger folks have to say about things. They're, so. they're very entrepreneurial mm -hmm. in the way they think, the way they see the world. And I think for a lot of them, they see starting their own business as providing more of an opportunity in long term than perhaps going out and finding a job. And I'm sure you have a lot of non-traditional age students yes. in addition to traditional age college students, but I would think that most of the traditional age college students also aren't attached to these ideas about what Hagerstown has been in the past no. and can see beyond that into a more creative future. I think um, for a lot of students, whether they're traditional or not, they look more for where are my opportunities rather than the physical appearance of something mm -hmm. or sort of the traditional attitudes about something. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean when I say they're very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> this is a very interesting, very exciting. How does it get paid for? Who buys the equipment? Who pays to keep the equipment going? I haven't, I haven't, uh, it's a glaring omission in my, in my, uh, in my update so far, but we have, uh, 
the U, we have a USDA grant that was uh, given to the city. We have left of that grant is uh, about $73,000 to complete the fit out. And all estimates so far that we're gonna be able to finish the fit out with that money. Uh, additionally, we have $100,000 to, to equip the facility. And that's a pretty hefty amount of money to equip a facility uh, like this. It's good though, because we can make it fairly cutting edge and we can make it very up to date. And, uh, and then uh, we, the building itself is, is, is uh, situated fairly well because we have a retail tenant up front and we have the back of the building is, uh, is leased by uh, Frostburg State. So, uh, and this is part of what the steering committee is, is discussing is how do we address, is there a membership? Is there a membership of part of this, a, a minimal membership uh, component that allows, you know, so many copies on the copy machine per month or things of that nature? Those are the, these are some of the many details we're kind of slogging through at this point. But, uh, but, and there's still a lot to be determined, but that's, we're, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty lucky in a lot, in a few ways for, with that. And when are you projecting to open it? Uh, that's a tough question. We like to do it, uh, 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 as soon as possible, obviously. It's going to take about 10 weeks to build out the, uh, the facility and we, uh, after we go through the bid procurement process and all that. At the same time that we're going through that, we are going to be working on programming and get everything, getting everything situated. So, uh. No firm date at this point. I'm not going to, uh, yeah, no firm That's date. That's fine. I was just curious yeah, if yeah, there was a yeah. projection. Uh, no. uh, but we're moving ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Brubaker. Staffing and managing the facility, I know the memo says that Dr. Matari and her students will, will do that. Is that, I mean, you can manage a f facility during business hours or what? Do you have enough resources to do that? And that's part of I me mean, to back it up or uh, dr matari herself might have an office in the facility uh so she will be a presence and then through an internship program it's anticipated that we get an, uh, an extra level of coverage there mm -hmm. uh, also with the money that we have for uh facility build out and equipping we can do card access uh there will be other ways to monitor the facility even if uh <clears throat> like if somebody needed to use a printer or somebody wanted to uh, to come in and, and access right. the facility uh, there'll be other ways to monitor it, even if there weren't somebody there 24/7. But these are these are these are, and I'm taking a stab at it. These are some details that need to still need but to work. But at the out. moment, the city's not planning to man the center. That's correct. Uh, That's correct. In that floor plan, mm -hmm. the big the area that big central area was mm -hmm. meant to be for the incubation area, or was it the the smaller offices on? The on the side, I guess I didn't quite understand. On that, on, on that floor plan, the smaller offices were meant to be kind of the in-house business incub businesses, house the businesses that will be incubated on site. Mm -hmm. The larger room could be used for anything and everything, uh, from trainings to, to meetings to anything else. So that's kind of our multi-use room. Okay. And is this Collider Fission or Fusion? <laughs> uh, fusion. <laughs> It went over everyone's head. That was I know, <laughs> right? That's kind of making me think too much there, Marty. Yeah, wow. What is the retail space envisioned for? That's a pretty small amount of retail space. It's very small. And, and, and again, mm -hmm. the, I mean, this is a very preliminary draft. This came out of uh, one quick, com well, extensive, but one uh, conversation with the architect. Uh, we're still going to be working on this because the, the f I mean, there is uh, additional retail space on site uh, at that property. So, because uh, this, this is sort of in, right in the middle of the building, actually, right? That's correct. Because this, this is the know, rear the of the, yep. the building. Yep. I was just curious if there were, I mean, it might be that that's part of what you use for someone who has a product they want to test or something like that, that's I would true. imagine. That's that true. kind of a thing. Yeah. But it's, I think it's a wonderful idea, and I really appreciate the efforts of uh, Dr. Matari and the folks at FSU, it's a great to have you still here in downtown. And how many students do you have in your program in any given semester or year? Well, I would say, and we've, we've been growing um, a lot, perhaps across all the programs, 400. I don't have the latest figures. Is that just in the business? No, no. Oh, that's, okay. that's across. How many in your business In the business program, I have 95 students right now. Okay. That is a big yeah. number of students. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Now that's a lot more than it was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, we wish you continued success, thank and you. thank you for uh, working with us on Absolutely. this. Absolutely. 
We'll be coming Pleasure. back in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming weeks with more updates. Okay. Yeah. Does any other council member have a question? Or? <laughs> it's funny. Uh, we went down and we, we've done a couple. We did a field trip. Went down to Frederick where they had the business factory, and it was a, a fairly similar uh, type model. And she kept talking about how the, the, a collider is kind of the when this, the woman, the director down there, how a collider is kind of the the buzz phrase for getting these resources and businesses together. And and you you try to force it through environmental design. I mean. Mm -hmm. The, 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 uh, the design of that facility is built so people kind of interact with each other on purpose. The and idea is that sparks will fly. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Yes. So that's yeah. why uh, we, want it, we want all these things to come together. And, uh, and we want people to have to go through that, that big room to get to the resources in the back because you never know who you're going to meet or what you're going to learn on the way. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like it. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for the update. Thank you. Is your mic okay? Is that thing working? The um, next item on our agenda is the role of the Hagerstown Redevelopment Authority, HRA, and changes to the code. And with us here today is uh, Mr. Listitian and Mr. Kearns from the city staff. Yes, we were, and we still are anticipating that Mr. Catlett uh, yeah, we're five minutes ahead, I noticed, um, on our agenda. W would it be okay if we uh, handled the liquor license? Sure. And we could call Andrew up? Absolutely. Is there any objection Andrew? to that on the council? I don't think so. So, to Give Mr. Catlett a few minutes. Sounds good. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to take an opportunity to talk to you about a, uh, uh, a recommendation that, uh, that staff has come up with. Uh, in talking to different downtown businesses, uh, we found that one of the barriers to continued restaurant growth in the downtown is the, uh, the, the liquor license requirement of 75 seats for a, uh, for a pouring license, which is your basic restaurant uh, license, beer, wine, and liquor. Uh, so uh, we did some research, and uh, different community, communities around the area kind of they run the gamut. Uh, Franklin County, PA, has a 50 seat requirement, a 30 seat requirement, and Frederick County has a 50 seat requirement. And uh, specifically, the, we've got a situation where uh, where different restaurants, if if they can squeeze 75 seats in, they do. And you know, it all, it all has to do with fire code, and they have to be 75 seats have to be approved. But then if they're limited to those 75 seats, they can't use other parts of their restaurant to offer other amenities to, to grow their establishments uh, in, in their footprint. Uh, and then at the same time, it, there are a couple businesses and uh, buildings in the downtown that as a result, you wouldn't be able to fit a restaurant. Uh, so a classic example, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about it briefly, is I don't know if anybody remembers Cafe Van Gogh on South Potomac Street. Nice little restaurant. Uh, he had, he had an extremely great product. He was, his, the word of mouth on that place was, he was on fire. He did he served a fantastic thing, but he was, he was extremely limited in his ability to, to, to prosper uh, because of his inability to have his uh, liquor license there. Uh, so, uh, so that's just kind of a classic example of, of why we think uh, the staff recommends that reducing the number of, uh, the requirement to 50 seats from 75 uh, would be very beneficial to, to the downtown and to businesses in general. And if, if I could just add one thing to that, what we're starting to see um, is people coming downtown to go to dinner and not necessarily <coughs> deciding beforehand where they go to eat. And that's a good thing uh, for, uh, for residents and visitors to, to come downtown knowing they, they have choices and to walk around. Uh, the smaller places, uh, they, they could get a, a, a bottle club permit and bring their own bottle of wine, but then that requires people to plan. We're, we're only going to this one place. And what we have seen in, in other communities mm -hmm. is the synergy uh, that's created when you have choice uh, and varied choice in, in the type of uh, restaurants that you can patronize <coughs> that are clustered together. 
And uh, so to promote that, uh, we were asking to formalize a request of the, the liquor board uh, to consider uh, reducing the, the seat requirement. Well, I think this is a great example of bringing feedback from the business community and those businesses who already exist and those looking at potentially opening a business and making a change based on that kind of feedback. And I, I would agree that I don't, I don't think it would be a negative thing. In fact, I would think more people in a room being served alcoholic beverages could potentially be more of a risk than less people. Hmm. So, I mean, if you really think about the point of that number of 75 seems rather arbitrary if you think about it. And um, now my understanding is the liquor board has the power to make this change without uh, any request or without any kind of state intervention well, as far as we know. And, and, and that I, I think we have to leave uh, up to them. I, I do believe it is in state law. Uh, their initial review was that, that they would be able to change that uh, and we're going to leave that up to uh, their counsel and, and them should, should uh, you uh, authorize a formal request for, for them to consider this. I would recommend we make that formal request. Can I ask a There's a good reason why it's 75. And the reason is Quite frankly, uh, it used to be the state that controlled this. And for 16 of the years that I was in Annapolis, I served on the Alcohol Alcoholic Beverage Subcommittee, which handled every bit of the uh, legislation pertaining to alcoholic beverages. And the reason was, was, quite frankly, we didn't want a beer joint in every corner. And I need to hear guarantees that reducing that number is not going to permit that to happen. I assume that if the number's reduced, there's still going to be a food sales requirement that will have to be met. Well, will that be reduced as well? No, sir. Uh, the only uh, number that, that we're looking at from a staff perspective is to reduce the, the seating requirement. Um, and as you're aware, uh, the regulations vary a lot county to county. Uh, some jurisdictions define restaurants um, uh, in addition to the percentage of food sales to uh, um, liquor sales, uh, they'll go so far as to say what type of investment had to be made in a building and um, uh, have to serve lunch and dinner or, or, or two seatings a day is how I, I think some, some counties uh, have, have their codes worded. Um, here, all we're talking about is reducing for restaurants the number of seats, but the food percentage would still be 51% of gross receipts would have to be food. Okay, some restaurants probably designed the restaurant around the fact that they had to have at least 75 seats. Mm -hmm. Now, these restaurants are going to, going to uh, and they did the right thing because they had to, <laughs> primarily. But now they're going to face competition from people who don't have the requirements that are nearly as stiff. Is, is, that, a fair, is that a fair thing to do to them? I, I would say that um, I think some may remove some tables and chairs because the rooms are crowded, even though it meets minimum codes. Um, and we, we have seen where people f fit in the number of required seats so they're able to get a license, um, not that they fill every seat. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't view it as being unfair competition. Um, I, I would view it as opening up additional opportunities for more restaurants in the downtown. There are still going to be restaurants in downtown who come and go, I assume. Yes, sir. Because they still will not be able to get alcoholic beverage licenses mm -hmm. because it can only hold 15 people or 20 people. Yes, sir. Um, how can you uh, say to them, okay, we're going to reduce it for some, but we're not going to reduce it for you. Have I, you talked to any of these people? Well, I haven't talked to places that are that small because we didn't envision this 
being uh, a, a, a requested change that would reduce the number to 15 or 20. Uh, we thought the number 50 was reasonable looking at Frederick's number uh, and looking at uh, Franklin County's number, uh, Montgomery County's 40. Um, what we thought that 50 is reasonable and it also brings uh, code in line. Uh, assembly permits are required at 50 people. Um, but um, uh, the, uh, by reducing this to 50, so wherever there's a liquor license, there's going to be the assembly permit, uh, which is a higher level of inspection from our, our fire marshal's office. Um, and in talking with uh, both Chief Holtzman and the uh, fire marshal's office and Chief Dietrich, um, from a staff perspective, we believe that the 50 number uh, was reasonable. I will say I, I did. I did. I have spoken to one individual who will not qualify at 50, uh, and his attitude was, and I and I, I hope it's contagious, uh, is that uh, is that no matter what, that's going to encourage more people to come downtown and to come to these restaurants, and just that alone will, will benefit his business. Okay, but I I'm, I intend to support this at 50. I wouldn't at 49, but I will at 50. I thought about it. This is a great deal. However, I do not want to return to those days. When we have uh, those those beer outlets or, or liquor outlets, not beer, liquor outlets downtown that used to give us so many problems. Uh, Andrew, you're too young, but <laughs> John can remember. But that's a different type of license, right? It, 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 were, it is a different type of license. That's a different type of, type of liquor there license. There weren't there weren't restaurants. But if, in but if, the, if the if the change occurs if the change occurs in such a way that it reduces the food requirement. It could, it could Correct. impact that. Correct. And so therefore, I, I mean, that's one of the things you need to thoroughly check out to see that yeah. the food requirement is not reduced. And, and, and we will, if that's the will of this body, we definitely will make sure in working with the liquor board to communicate that. Okay. So Don supports 50. Mr. Alshire, what do you, what do you say? I mean, I think the, the conservative mantra is always that, you know, capitalism thrives best when government gets out of the way. So. Uh, for me, I, I find any of these numbers to be arbitrary. I mean, I look at the places downtown. I think once you get below 30, you typically are getting into your actual bars. Uh, so, I mean, I'd be willing to go as low as 30. I'd probably go lower. I, I just, I think you're picking a number uh, out of a hat, regardless of what you do. Uh, the key word in this entire memo you gave us is responsible. I mean, if a restaurant's responsible, it's going to be responsible with 15 people or 50 or 150. Uh, so, so the key to this isn't some arbitrary number we assign to it. The key to it is the level of responsibility the property owner is going to have in, in their establishment. So if other folks want to go lower than 50. Uh, I, I think 30 uh, is a pretty adequate number for the spaces that I can envision downtown before they become your actual bars. How about you, Mr. Brubaker? Well, I'll, I'll go along with it. Uh, I share with Kristen, I think it's somewhat hard to know what that number is, especially since the key indicator is that percentage of, of food, uh, you know, and, and other uh, aspects of responsible ownership uh, that can be enforced by the liquor board. So th those are the key, I think, more so than the size of the place. Um, you, you could have a very small shop that uh, operates at elegant standards, you know. So, but if, if 50 is a consensus, I, I will go along with that. Ms. Nye? You got passed over. Okay. Start on this end. Uh, my only concern was is that I thought in talking to Andrew that it was specifically going to be the Arts and Entertainment District. Okay. Knowing that it's going to be citywide, uh, that's where I have concerns. I, you know, you have these restaurants that are, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many more, and I'm looking at the public safety aspect. All right as in how many is going to pop up somewhere now that this is all the requirement is going to be instead of having to hold to 75 and then are we going to be on top of it? I think the liquor board would still go through whatever process well, they go I'm through Well, I'm just saying, you know, that licenses. was my concern and I discussed it with Andrew and you, the more that people talk here, they specifically say downtown, mm -hmm. but we're looking citywide mm -hmm. and citywide is the one that, you know, Business anywhere in the city is it's, good. So you know, if people want to open up new restaurants, even if it's a shopping liquor, center in the but, city. But the thing is, okay, yes, it's good, but we're still looking at liquor 
okay, mm -hmm. and the whole seating aspect, where before it was 75, we drop it down to 50. And again, they are supposed to be responsible. Once they leave, that responsibility stops, okay? And I don't have a problem with it being in the downtown area. I don't have, you know, the arts and entertainment. Citywide concerns me. Okay. And Mr. Metzner, you're going. Okay. Well, it seems like we have consensus to move forward with the formal request then. And, and we'll make that request of the, the liquor board. Um, should the liquor board act on this request and reduce the number from 75 to 50? Uh, we have local legislation, it's a bottle club ordinance, that we would then bring back to the mayor or council in a work session. Uh, because right now, uh, places that cannot hold the 75, but 74 or less, uh, can apply for this bottle club. And we would uh, review that ordinance and come back with a recommendation. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Catlett is here. Oh, okay, great. Mr. Catlett, welcome to the table. Fine, thank you. And let me just preface this item by saying, um, you know, when I took office as the chief executive of the city, I feel like it's my role to look at all the different aspects of the city government to make sure that they're functioning according to the code. That is indeed the job of the mayor. So when I look at the code and I see that we have a Hagerstown Redevelopment Authority, that conjures up in my mind all kinds of things that I think some an authority should be doing. So I asked staff to look into this, and that is why we proposed the changes that we introduced at the last regular session. Uh, since then, uh, some citizens have come in and made comments uh, that I truly believe are off the wall uh, in regard to what is being proposed that we do with the, uh, the what we're going to call the Hagerstown Loan Review Committee. So could you please explain, uh, I know you guys did some follow-up, and I know Mr. Catlett's here, so he can testify as to what exactly, you've been on the, the committee now for 20 years? 21. 22, 21 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Take it away. Well, uh, a few things. Um, we've met with the HRA on this subject, and uh, since the last meeting, we've met with the HRA on this again and spoke about the role, the historic role, of the HRA. Mr. Boyer uh, has uh, reviewed the code and relevant uh, related codes. Um, from a staff perspective, we see uh, no need to create an amendment to what was introduced last month. Uh, Mr. Catley can share uh, his experience uh, on the HRA and what it is that the HRA is focused on for the last 20 years. Uh, my experience in the past 20 years is um, primarily there has been a degree of confusion because I was always under the impression that we were abiding by the laws of um, uh, HUD and uh, that was our strategy to follow that and in fact uh, and when our meetings were uh, taking place there was an agenda we followed for a number of years 16 17 18 years open close and uh, then uh, most recently uh, John and I had a discussion and Jonathan and uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, none of what I had believed some years ago was even valid. That, uh, but that's the way when I was brought into this, uh, uh, to this gun, to this committee, I was told that all of the monies, with the exceptions of maybe one of the boards, one of the uh, funding parts there, was controlled by HUD. My, the explanation I was given in 1991 was the money was uh, handed down from HUD to Annapolis, and Annapolis uh, divided it up and handed it to various uh, parts of the uh, state. And we had to follow the protocol of what HUD uh, had suggested. <coughs> and, uh, but then I've been told that that is not the case, and we've been unable to uh, find anything. And, uh, in writing that supports what I was told some years ago. So I hope I'm not being confusing here. And uh, No, yeah. that's, that's good yeah. because that was my question. Yeah. Paperwork, there should be a trail. And obviously there has not been a trail no. from the time that this started. There's, there's minutes uh, from 1985 when this was created. And um, the minutes uh, in terms of activity 
it's been related to all loans. Exactly, all loans. So yeah. for, for your 20 years, is it safe to say that everything you've done has been related to loans? A everything's been, uh, everything that I've, uh, in all, uh, in the capacity that I've operated, it's always been related to loans. So the Hagerstown Redevelopment Authority never took on any kind of redevelopment project? No, sir. Okay. <laughs> so make sure that's clear. <laughs> and um, the, the current code uh, outlines um, two, two loan programs, and that's a rehabilitation loan program and a building demolition loan program. That's what's in the code. Uh, in practice, uh, the HRA reviews the business revolving loans, uh, all the community development block grant loans, whether they're residential, commercial, public facility, as well as the women and minority owned business loans. Uh, what we're proposing is that the language says that the HRA will review all loans. And so that could be future loan programs that are established. Um, again, we found nothing in the minutes from 1985 uh, that indicated that the HRA did anything other than loans. Uh, there was an occasional grant. Um, the city does designate every year an entity to review uh, or to administer the community development plot grant program. And that's done through our annual action plan. And historically, the city has designated a, uh, a city department to administer that, that program. And um, in the latest one that you all approved in June, uh, the Department of Community and Economic Development was, was designated. Uh, to administer the program. Um, the HRA uh, in the proposed changes would continue to um, review, approve, deny, modify all loan requests. Um, they're advising us now on collection policies as well as reviewing uh, the overall policies to make recommendations to the mayor and council. Um, the new name that uh, is proposed to Hagerstown uh, Loan Review Authority uh, actually describes what we do. Hagerstown Redevelopment Authority, uh, I was often asked um, by individuals who would come along, and, what is it that we are redeveloping? And I have no answer. And I know I'm being redundant with this, but yeah, it's, this is, a, I think this is an excellent move. And it's, um, something that we can actually see uh, what is actually going on. Rather than have to answer a question about redeveloping, I haven't redeveloped a thing in 21 or 22 years for the city of Hagerstown. What? Uh, I've made decisions on monies that have been requested, but uh, that's the extent of it. Well, I think maybe a key to that is, it should be clarified, is uh, we're definitely not saying that, that item B hasn't been getting done, just that your committee hasn't been doing it. That's a fair statement, yes. Yeah. Okay. And there are many agencies and uh, uh, organizations in this community that, uh, whose goal or mission is to do redevelopment. Sure. And so that is why I wanna make sure that as I'm looking at all the various uh, interests that this government has in the community, that what we're being a part of, that these people are actually accomplishing their mission. So if, if your mission is to review loans and uh, act in as advisor for the city in that capacity, then I think a well-defined uh, name helps clarify the role. Um, and then we can look at our uh, relationships with those other organizations as well. I think when the, the statement is that uh, we review loans and uh, they are declined or um, um, the loan is extended to the, uh, the applying party based upon substance and merit. Uh, and not who knows somebody in the mayor's office or on the council. That's the way it's It supposed. takes the politics out of who Don't. gets loans in the city of Hagerstown. Exactly. So that having not always been the case. Yes. Does any other council member have questions or comments at this point? No, I was just looking for paperwork. <laughs> so there's no paper trail. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for the follow-up on this. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here, Mr. Thank Cap. you. Thank you. My we'll, pleasure. We'll, we'll bring this back for uh, approval at the regular <coughs> session. The, the, the code changes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Maryland State Retiree Option for a 401A. Ms. Paulson. Good evening. Well, the um, packet memo goes into more of the detail in the background of why staff is recommending looking at designing a plan. Um, staff does believe that the 401A option is a fair thing to do at minimal cost. Uh, and we're seeking your approval to meet with the Deferred Compensation Committee to design a plan to bring back for your consideration and approval. Pardon my ignorance on this. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between 401A and 401B? An IRS definition. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they're basically deferred compensation programs. They're all deferred compensation programs, yes. Um, to, to give you an idea, if someone retires from the state, it, it does put us at somewhat of a competitive disadvantage. You have someone who's a 25, 30 year employee uh, who could bring a wealth of experience to the city. And um, unfortunately, we don't really have much of a retirement benefit to offer them um, since they're not eligible due to Maryland State to re enroll in the plan. And we do have a couple of employees in that situation. It does happen from time to time where people approach us. It does. As state retirees mm -hmm. interested in work here. And I, and I do foresee this as being an optional plan. We would want to give the prospective employee a choice. Well, I think forming a committee to come up with the draft is a good work in progress. Does anyone else have any? Objections? <coughs> no, but I need to ask a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. In reading this, I noticed that uh, it applies only to full-time employees. Correct. Um, there are part-time employees in the city, and it's likely that you could have part-time employees that retired from the state. Why does it not apply, apply to part-time employees as well? Currently, our deferred compensation pr plan is I'm limited. Sorry, I can't hear you. That's okay. Our current uh, deferred compensation plan is limited to full-time employees. Um, we could evaluate extending it to part-time. That would be up to the committee to price out and decide. Is that something you'd be interested in having the committee look at? Yeah, I, I, I would, if you, could, if you could take a look at that. Um, sure. Are any other council members interested in, would this be for all deferred comp, comp plans or, Donna, are you, are you talking about just state retirees or, or any part-time employee for I guess the just, deferred comp? Plan? Just the state okay. retirees. Okay. All right. Any other questions or feedback? All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, folks from the planning department, Mr. Rohrbach. Good afternoon. This is uh, Hager's Crossing Put Amendment uh, ZM 2013-01, uh, bringing this back to you work session. We had our public hearing on this on July, was it July 23rd? Mm -hmm. I think it was. Yep. Yes. It's been so um, long you forgot already. I huh? know. <laughs> Where does the time go? Um, at the public hearing, we heard testimony from the assistant county attorney as well as uh, a representative from Frederick Cyber and Associates, both representing the applicant, and they testified in favor of the PUD amendment to allow the school. Uh, we also heard from one resident out in Hager's Crossing who is also in favor of the uh, amendment to allow the school. And in your packet, I included uh, three emails that I received from in, during the 10-day post uh, hearing record period um, from Hager's Crossing residents and they were all in favor of the amendment to allow the school. I did not receive any comments uh, that were um, any negative comments on this and also just to remind you that had, we had ten, we also heard from ten folks uh, during our planning commission public review meeting uh, way back in May that were also in favor of the school also in that, live in that neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> again, just to remind you that the um, 
at their June 12th meeting, the Planning Commission uh, recommended approval of the PUD with the condition that the school be oriented towards Hager's Crossing Drive. It should be close enough to the street to provide for a more traditional neighborhood design. The concept alternative that's been in your packet um, today, as well as in previous packets, um, is, gener is generally consistent with that provision, uh, with that condition, I should say. And uh, again, the concept alternative is not a site plan, so there would be, we expect, expect some variability between the concept alternative and um, what will come into our office, but the two, but the intent should be the same. Um, so we're bringing this before you today to uh, get your all's uh, feeling on where, where this should go from here. And at this time, I'll take any questions you have. Questions, anybody? So when will we officially, when do we have to? Uh, we would we did we introduce this already? No, sir. We would um, introduce we would, it at the next. We would introduce it at the end of bring it for introduction at the uh, end of August. Okay. And then a vote for adoption in September at the regular meeting. And do we need? We, no, there's no need for a special session or anything. It, no. We don't want to hold the board of education up. No. Um, and in fact, um, <laughs> we were um, we're actually uh, ahead of schedule. Okay. Uh, we. We had planned. We had, we had, we were up front with the board of ed and the county, telling them what the process was. Okay. We said, I think seven months. Well, I think we we're at six months. So we're actually ahead of ahead one month. Well, I appreciate that. Thank we, you. We we offered them the opportunity to do simultaneous site plan processing if they so choose, if they were ready. And they they were not at that stage yet. Gotcha. So. I think the city's been very accommodating in this process to uh, assist the board of ed in this project. So. Look forward to continuing that positive relationship. <clears throat> Thanks for your work on this, Alex. Thank you very much. All right, more planning. We have the land management code revision phase three. <clears throat> Mr. Bachmiller has arrived in the nick of time. for you this evening and follow up to the public hearing that was held in zoning text amendment 2003-01. This is a package of approximately two dozen uh, text amendments to the land management code, um, some of which are new material, some of which are clean up from the comprehensive revision process that we went through over the last few years. Since the public hearing, we've received one piece of correspondence that was in your packet. That is a letter from Mrs. Jesse Unger owner of a property on uh, dual highway uh, where it splits there at the McDonald's uh, on the north side. Um, and uh, that was entered into the record. The letter was dated July 28th. Uh, letter's about half a page long, uh, citing some concerns that she has. Also, we included in your packet the uh, comments submitted by the city, city's economic development uh, manager, Jill Estavia, regarding uh, the possibility of allowing a special exception for retail uses under certain conditions by special exception in the IR zoning district. Uh, we've met uh, a few times over this particular issue. We gave you a presentation at a public meeting prior to the public hearing. I don't want to uh, rehash all of that. Like I said, it's, it's about nine pages worth of material for 24 different issues, and we'll just uh, uh, ask, I guess, at this point, if you have any questions. And also that, uh, just to indicate the planning staff does not have an issue with the proposal from the economic development manager regarding the special exception for retail in the IR district. Go ahead. Yes. Steve, uh, does the problem that was outlined in the uh, Jesse Younger letter Mm -hmm. That's as far as I could tell from reading this material. That's completely taken care of. Uh, the issue being, she discusses a number of issues. Let's see. Uh, she talks about whether or not trees should be re um, part of the landscaping requirements. Well, yeah, but there was an issue I think more important than that, having to do with 
the, the use of the property in the future. It was lifting the 40,000 square foot minimum use area, was it not? Oh, okay. Um, that, the way uh, it's written, we would lift the minimum 40,000 square foot use area. And what that would do uh, for Ms. Unger's property, currently, if someone wants to come in and want to create a car sales facility at that property at this point, the answer would be that it's not a permitted use because the property is too at small. At this point being today. Correct. With this provision, uh, if the proposed amendments go into place, she will then be able to move forward and utilize the property uh, for car sales. Meeting um, all the other standards. Meeting all the other standards or the planning that. commission appro approving some sort of alternate uh, right. proposal Variation. that meets the in intention of, mm -hmm. of what we were trying to achieve there. But uh, right now, she can't do it at that, that location. With the new change, with the changes that would be, uh, if they were adopted, she would be able to do car sales. Does there. she understand that now? She, I believe so. It's, I, I got the impression that yeah. she was made aware that that was the case. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The property's been re-grandfathered. Actually, it wouldn't be grandfathered so much as it would be a permitted use, provided they just meet use, the site plan but requirements. It still yes. would be, we're allowing grandfathering on some of these used car lots, are we not? In Mrs. Unger's case, because the most recent use was not car sales, right. it's, uh, it's treated as in any other property in the CG zoning okay. district, which means that uh, for to, to have a proposal right. for car sales, they would need to come in with a site plan and show uh, compliance with the landscape standards or discuss some sort of alternate compliance right. with the Planning Commission. Right, but, but have we not uh, extended the grandfathering provision for used car lots? Yes, if Ms. Unger's, um, if there had not been an intervening use for Ms. Unger, it just had sat vacant for many years, this new text would say, as long as the last use had been car sales, they would be exempt from these new landscape standards. So that, that would be, in a way, sort of extending the grandfathering for an existing car sales facility that doesn't meet the current, or the yes. proposed standards. Which is more than bending over backwards. That was the response to all the other owners that came in and said their property would be usable. and. Under this, it could sit empty. It, if they sell it for another purpose, and it, it no longer has the grandfathering provision, and that's certainly reasonable, they could come back under the 40,000 foot provision, which again is much more flexible than before. So I think the Planning Commission worked hard to respond to the complaints, and yet try to protect the city's interests as well. There's a countervailing interest mm -hmm. there to have a reasonable presentation on these properties. The Planning Commission always does fine work. <laughs> and generally they are very open to people's alternative ideas if there's something unusual about their property that makes it impossible or not feasible to do the exact letter of the law. They, they usually work very well with property owners on alternative plans. As does the staff. And the way this ordinance uh, amendment is actually proposed, it actually gives textual guidance to the Planning Commission essentially to be as accommodating as practical, uh, I would say even possibly above and beyond what their normal level of accommodation would be. Mr. Alshar. Speaking to a different uh, issue, just for clarity, have these proposed changes or any changes that your office has brought before this body for consideration changed the context in which the original approval was granted for the operation of HubScrap. The amendments in late last year, which have been under a prior administration, uh, we um, put forward uh, some amendments that allowed uh, recycling facilities that are entirely indoors to be permitted uh, in uh, certain industrial zoning districts. It's a little bit different. It was kind of brought to our attention due to the hub scrap situation. Uh, we looked at the issue of recycling facilities in a little bit more detail and thought maybe that needed some tweaking. So no changes to uh, the application of zoning ordinances have been brought before this body for approval, which would have changed uh, the decision as it relates to that original approval, correct? That's the case, yeah, okay. I don't believe so. Or to the prior administration. 
I think he um, said the prior administration made made changes. But the only change we made was Hub to scrap. allow recycling fully under cover, and that yeah. does not exist at Hub Scrap. Yeah, the, the, the Hub Scrap situation raised a general field of issues that we looked at in a little bit more detail and made some changes, but they did not affect Hub Scrap directly. And the definitions are now clearer and more distinct about the difference between warehousing, <coughs> junkyards, and recycling. So there was a little bit of tweaking of the warehousing and the junkyard definitions as well to make it clearly distinct. And so now that operation fits fully within the definition of those land use codes as they have been changed. We don't have a firm answer on that yet because that property was subject to a recent uh, board, uh, board of Zoning Appeals right. administrative hearing uh, regarding past interpretations and we're still waiting on the Board of Zoning Appeals written decision uh, before we can dissect it and figure out the exact status of that situation. As far okay. as we can tell, it's a nonconformity at this point. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Um, Mr. Burbank? I won't, I won't go so far as to say the Planning Commission's always right, or I never don't always agree, but, you know, they do work hard on these things. All volunteers, no salary. I know that. For work sure. hard and, and try to figure this stuff out and give us good recommendations. That's what I'll say. But uh, so, thanks, mm -hmm. and and thank the staff who tries to frame the issues so that people can talk about them intelligently. The package that's before you right now does not include the recommended uh, or requested change from the economic development manager. And so, if you're interested. In pursuing that, we would need to adjust the amendments for introduction to include that. I think we should do that. Adjust the uh, uh, the changed text, or the text amendments, prior to introduction, so that it gets incorporated into the change. Right. I think some of the concerns the commission would have had are incorporated in their uh, uh, in the the proposal as it's written now. Mm -hmm. We Just worked with Dick and I. Mm -hmm. Kathy, what, what the language would do is provide for general retail as a special exception. Right, as long as it doesn't. IR zone. Right, as long as it doesn't occupy more than 25 percent. Right. And the special exception then allows the Board of Zoning Appeals to hold a public meeting. <coughs> Anybody in the area who might have some issues with that use has a chance to air their concerns. And the Board of Zoning Appeals can consider whether there's anything unusual about that particular site that would make retail there untenable for the neighborhood. I'm fine with that. Okay. A whole lot of work. A whole lot sort, of work. Yeah, it's sort of a multi-use concept because some, some of the those kinds of businesses want to do some retail that springs from their operations. I so can give you a perfect kind example. Kind of a multi-use concept. My uh, good friend and college roommate bought, ended up buying the candy company that he started working for as a golf caddy. Forbes Candies in Virginia Beach. If anyone ever goes to Virginia Beach, go to the strip and go to Forbes <laughs> Candies. But he bought, he's like Willy Wonka, he has his own little chocolate factory. Uh, and it's on a piece of industrial property, it was by the Naval Air Station. Well he thought it'd be perfectly reasonable to have a little retail store set up at his factory where he makes the candy and then people could do tours and then buy stuff on the way out. Well little did he know that there's a restriction next to the air station that no general retail is permitted in that industrial zone. So the whole idea of if you make something and you want to sell a little bit of it in the front, I think is what we're trying to accomplish here with this kind of amendment. It would also allow though other folks who are not making things on the site to have a retail operation. It's, it would allow for general. Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna say a lot of work went into this since this, this thing was brought to our attention and uh, a whole lot of work. And we appreciate uh, the amount of work and effort and thought and consideration to solving the problems of, of a lot of people that, that uh, you all put into it. Thank you. And I the think, difference I think they, they, they got about 98 or 99 percent of what they wanted, yeah. which is not a bad deal. Yeah, this is good. Okay. I, I, I'm guessing we have oh. consensus then it's okay to include these in the text amendment. Okay, thank you. I wanted to clarify that. When do we, when we anticipate the introduction? That will be the end of August? Yes. Okay. Thank you.
Next item on the agenda is the economic assessment of Hagerstown's sustainable community plan. Take it away. Some uh, handouts for you. I'm not going to belabor it with actually running a PowerPoint, but just for your, your benefit. We're here because um, it's been brought to our attention that $100,000 has been made available to the city in DBED's budget for a downtown planning project. And um, we're here before you to seek authorization to accept that grant as well as to um, advertise an RFP for consultant services to do a project that we're going to describe to you. We've conferred with, conferred with the DBED staff and they've indicated what we're about to propose to you would be an acceptable use of the funds that have been set aside for the city. What we're recommending is we seek proposals from planning and economic analysis firms to assist us with, with a two-fold type of project, an economic assessment of the downtown revitalization strategy, strategies in Hagerstown's sustainable community plan, which is from 2012, and do a community engagement exercise to garner support and input on the city's downtown plan. And the reason we're recommending that strategy is we, we do not believe we need to create a downtown plan. We have a downtown plan. The 2012 plan incorporates our latest assessment on the downtown's assets and detractions, vision for the future, and strategies for achieving that vision. In the packet that you received, there's a copy of the sustainable community plan, which was put together with input from a community stakeholders group. And there's also this, um, this PowerPoint that I just handed out that, that illustrates, the, the, uh, summarizes what's in the downtown planning documents and then how we've been implementing it over the years are some photographs. So while we don't feel we need to create a downtown plan, we definitely believe we need public support and investor confidence in the vision that's spelled out in our plan and also more tools to help us implement that plan. And so how we plan to achieve that with this project is we would focus on implementation in order to generate momentum and help us develop projects that will create value, manage risk, and improve our prospects for success. The project would include an economic impact analysis and renderings of up to eight catalyst projects <coughs> We would determine what those catalyst projects would be, also with help with this community engagement. But some ideas of catalyst projects that are in our existing planning documents are uh, downtown hotel, heritage museum, other entertainment anchors, new or renovated office space, market rate apartments. Those are kinds of things that are currently recommended in the plan. So this uh, consultant would do in economic impact analysis of, of whatever catalysts we determine are our top priorities and to do some renderings to show us, as well as the community investors, what that could be like. Um, so the consultants would, first they would do uh, review market conditions affecting our downtown and Hagerstown as a whole, conduct an economic assessment of the feasibility and the impact of the strategies in our downtown, in downtown Hagerstown outlined in the existing plan, explore linkage opportunities between the downtown and surrounding areas and recommend specific strategies to improve those relationships, lead a community engagement exercise to garner support and input, and input on the plan and develop an implementation strategy that will help the city market our vision to potential investors in the private sector. We hope at the end of this project, which we're anticipating it would be uh, about a six month project, so by the end of April, we're hoping that we would have built community support for a shared vision for the downtown. We'd have the data and an implementation strategy to gain investor confidence and we'd have momentum rolling to work with our community stakeholders and new investors to develop specific on-the-ground projects to implement that vision. And so that's what we're here for. And able to answer any questions, hopefully able to answer any questions you might have. Go ahead. So maybe my first question is, is can we give the money back? But, you know, I look at this and at the EDC meeting last week, uh, one of their five strategic priorities of the EDC is the city center. Um, and uh, they've already put together a committee uh, that I believe is chaired by Ed Lowe uh, and includes uh, seven or eight folks, uh, I, don't, I don't think any of which are residents of the city, to, to lead this EDC strategic uh, um, you know, committee as part of one of those five charges. Uh, we have our economic development office here, uh, you know, which you know, during that meeting you know, the EDC, I think the comments were the, the, that they haven't heard from our EDC office, which I, I, I find very hard to believe. I know you guys are working hard. Um, I think the number of places opening show that. And then we have the Downtown Alliance, 
uh, you know, we, which I'm assuming is, is operating in some form, um, you know, since, since the, uh, the stadium issue. And uh, I'm just trying to envision the startup of what I would consider a fourth group to do generally the same thing. Um, and I, I, I'm just trying to figure out is, is the goal here to bring those various entities under one house, so to speak? Is the goal to create a committee that will uh, be created and, and exist concurrently with what the EDC's city center committee is doing? Um, and, you know, what entity will it be the consultants, the city, our, e, uh, our, our economic development office overseeing, uh, you know, or will it be similar to how the, the downtown alliance was and, and the stadium committee process was where it, it frankly is, is, is a group of stakeholders, uh, that, you know, that, 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 are, that are charting the course and direction for, for an effort by the city. Uh, I, I guess so I'm, let I'm me trying help. to figure that out. I'm trying to understand. You're, you want to give the $100,000 back because you don't like the EDC creating a center city committee? I, no, I mean, we're, we're going to spend $100,000 uh, planning on, on a plan. Uh, and, and we've got three other entities right now mm -hmm. operating generally independently of various stakeholders doing things in, in some various concurrent manner. Well, let me just say this. This uh, document, the, the RFP, basically, is came from a series of meetings that I have had with staff. That we've had also a DBED, so we could understand exactly what limitations, if any, were on this $100,000. Right. In talking with staff and looking at the plans that already exist, they're already out there. We have lots of plans. Oh, yeah. The Where goal of using $100,000 that's being provided by the state is to gain not only community understanding of what the plans already are in, in place, but also input on what catalyst projects the community needs and what also the, com what the economy, the local economy, can bear. Uh, one of the things we've identified is, you know, we have a plan. What we don't know is how that plan can be implemented given the economic situation in Hager's. We don't have that information. So the goal of the uh, the RFP is to get that information on the, it's to do the economic assessment, and then truly is to have at the end the pretty pictures to show people what Hagerstown can become if we were to implement all of the various plans. I truly believe that until we present the public, and even ourselves, with the pretty pictures of what Hagerstown can become, uh, given and here it says eight catalyst projects. Certainly, we will want feedback on what those projects should be. Uh, and we should talk to the Downtown Alliance, which I believe existed well before any stadium discussion ever came about. Uh, the business people, obviously the residents uh, in and around uh, downtown. That, I think, is the goal. So not only uh, the product really is the economic assessment, the, pic the pretty pictures, what are we going to get, what's it going to look like, uh, and then the uh, community input the, and community support of, hopefully, what we have planned. So I f truly don't want to give back the $100,000. I think that would be silly, and I think that the folks at the state would not take us seriously in any plan that we present to them for any assistance with in the future. But I understand your point which is that there are duplicative organizations out there all portending to be uh, for the same mission. And that is a problem because it diffuses energy. And, you know, years ago, I remember, uh, not too long ago, but maybe a couple years ago, Hagerstown Magazine had a little graphic and it had all the various organizations out there that some of them you just mentioned and all the other ones we know about. And at the center is a big question mark. Well, I think as a city, as a body, as a government, we should be at the middle of that question mark. 
and we should be getting the feedback of all those various institutions, but we should be driving the car. So I think hopefully what this process will allow us to do is take the driver's seat with the help of whoever we get uh, as the, uh, the contractor to guide us through this. It's really more than a, a plan, it's more of an action plan uh, because we need, uh, I, I truly believe that people really need to see what is possible in Hagerstown because until you present that picture, it's just words and you're talking about how much it's gonna cost. I mean, I tried to get this, this group to consider a stormwater management fee so we can make improvements, but it's hard, I think, for anybody to say, yes, let's move forward with uh, spending you know, a large amount of money for major public investment if you don't know what it's gonna look like in the end or how it's gonna connect with other amenities in town. So I think that's the true goal, and, and staff can correct me if I'm off base on this, of the point of this RFP. <coughs> Mr. The, the difficulty I have is a couple of things. So, suffice it to say, first of all, that it sounds like I'll just sure use the word bureaucratic and leave it at that. Uh, having said that, this brings me to mind of the hotel motel tax. There was a time when we had the hotel motel tax come into existence for the funding of the stadium. Last I heard is if we were going to have a state, state funding, we're never going to get state funding without a plan. So we went for planning money. And we got $100,000 of planning money from the state. And we have this beautiful thing that says, Hagerstown's plan for downtown. I only have one question. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a plan for downtown? Um, this implies that we do. We've been talking for two years now about the largest downtown investment in the history of the city, $30 million stadium, and we're not even talking about it. Matter of fact, people ask me what's going on with the stadium. My answer is I'm only a city councilman. I don't know. We haven't discussed it since April. So now we're talking about a plan to implement another plan. I mean, it seems to me we're either going to have a stadium downtown or we're not. If we're going to have a stadium downtown, this downtown plan takes on a whole different dimension than if it doesn't. Specifically, we have a, a, an area downtown where we have condemned buildings, we have buildings coming down. I mean, I just don't understand how we talk about a plan for downtown while the biggest white elephant in the room is just ignored, and that is a $30 million investment in a downtown stadium. It seems to me what we need to do is decide whether or not we're going to move forward with that, and if we are, use this $100,000 in planning money to find out exactly what it is the state needs us to produce documentation-wise to get the state money. Otherwise, we're asking the state for $100,000 in planning money, not even mentioning the fact that we may be looking to build a stadium downtown. And we have been told, well, at first, least by people well, that let I me, thought... Let me interrupt, because there's nothing that says we're not going to talk about a stadium when it comes to this process. Well, I, it may not be in here that that is uh, one of the things on our plate, but it well, certainly it, is. Well, Mayor, that's the point. It certainly I mean, is. I mean, come on. Let's talk about a stadium or not talk about a stadium. To, to talk about a plan for downtown while this lingers in the air with absolutely no discussion, no movement, no nothing, I mean, either way, if we're going to go ahead and try to get a downtown stadium, then let's discuss it and let's do it. If we're not, I'm all for something like this. But until we make that decision, I don't know, I mean, this isn't a minor decision. Like I say, this is, we're talking about upwards of a $30 million investment in our downtown. If we were going to do that, if we were going to make that investment, I think we need $100,000 to assist in the planning for how it all works out. Well, let me just say, that is part of what the state is demanding of us, is what are you going to have besides just a stadium? 
And by the way, anywhere we build, any of the three locations that we are considering to build a stadium are well, within the state's designated sustainable community Who's area. considering three locations, Mayor? We had, a, we had a discussion in April. To my knowledge, it has not been discussed since then. The implication that we're, we're considering three sites implies that we are doing anything. We as a council are doing absolutely nothing. And we as a council have done absolutely nothing since April. As a government body, we have not had an executive committee meeting. We have not had a public meeting. We have had no discussions. I do not Frankly, that's because there's nothing to bring to the table. And I have been working since April, and perhaps I don't give everybody as regular an update as they would like. But until I have something to bring to the table, what is there to discuss? Besides to discuss going over the same information going... that we've been going over uh, to, to consider the same kinds of information and spin our wheels, which then will be interpreted as we can't make a decision. Well, so no. really, truly, I think Mr. Alshar has identified you have identified it. Until there is private uh, assistance with the financing of this stadium, it is very hard to make a deal happen. How do you get private stadium? financing for a stadium when you haven't even chosen a site or discussed it? How do you do that? How do you go out and seek private financing when you don't have a plan? And I'm just curious when you say this is part of it, I'm curious whether the word stadium is even mentioned in here. And I doubt that it is. I, I just don't understand. All I do is read in the paper about Well, that's your everything. first mistake, reading the paper. <laughs> well, if I had another source of information as an elected official, I may not have to resort to that. Uh, for instance, I have said it, and I'll repeat it again. When you say the same old thing, this, this administration, this council has never even discussed the potential lease. It's never even discussed it. So when you say discuss the same old stuff over and over and rehash it, we've never discussed it. We've never discussed it. Uh, to my knowledge, the last discussion we had about the stadium was when we got the presentation uh, on the sites and we had some discussion about site selection and, and left it at that. I just, it becomes frustrating because everywhere I go, people will ask the same question, what's going on with the Suns? And my answer now becomes, I have no idea. But for instance, me, I, I have things to discuss. I have things to discuss like sending Mr. Quinn a letter saying this lease that he's currently under will not be renewed after next season and want him to know that. I have discussions to say that we should put RFPs out for other minor league non-affiliated teams to give us proposals for continuing to play in municipal stadium. But if we're not going to discuss the Suns and we're not going to discuss what the city government has decided our negotiating point should be and whether we're going to say at some stage of the game we don't want to negotiate anymore, and that's my only problem. When I see a plan for Hagerstown, $100,000 to spend on trying to implement what we've already decided we should implement, and in all due respect to staff, I think you guys have done an excellent job of implementing a lot of this stuff, and I mean that seriously, and, and you give examples of what we've done. And I, I don't agree with Kristen that we should give the $100,000 back, but I think we need to make a decision somewhere along the line whether a stadium is in the future or if it isn't. Uh, that, that's that's all. I just don't know how we discuss downtown and not even discuss that issue. Yes, Mr. Brubaker. Um, I'm going to return to the sustainable plan, if I may. Um, I think it's labeled economic assessment. It's not labeled a plan. It's labeled, you know, we all complained that, that we don't need to plan anymore. We need to plan how, we need to figure out how to move out beyond the plan and implement them. Um, and uh, I would, Mayor, beg to differ on the term pretty picture. I think we need hard, nitty-gritty economic assessment. And, and I think we need to find a consultant that, that can help us understand the markets we need to reach 
that might want to invest in Hagerstown. It can't be another exercise of talking to the same people and everybody talking inwards and all that. It needs to be outward focused. I think the bones of it are here, but 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 I don't want to. I, I think an think implementation. The, when I say needs pretty pictures, be, I know I'm I'm being slightly. I, I, flipped, I know, and but I'm that's being, not in substitution of the market analysis that you're talking right. about because that is very important. That's part of right. But but I think we need a hard nitty gritty market analysis of where we can go, who we can bring in with ideas and innovation and b buildings like ours have been uh, uh, remodeled all over the state. It's, it's not the buildings per se. It's perceptions of Hagerstown. It's the rents we can command uh, or we can't command that won't allow us to build a class A office building, much less, you know, you know, fix up other buildings, which costs about the same as building a Class A office building. Well, and those are the things so, we need to understand but, and but, that the public but, needs to but understand. But we also need to go, you know, beyond somebody that can, can, can uh, give us ideas about how to get beyond the usual players, the usual thing. I think that's what it's going to take. We've been struggling since before even lose time to, to, to find these solutions. And administration after administration has, has tried things, including the, the terms I've been on and, and we all have here. Um, and Don, through his work with the state, has been very familiar with this. I, I, I hope that we can find some new, some new channels. Uh, I, I know that there's groups in town that are earnestly working hard to try to find solutions, and, and I commend them for that, and I wish them luck. But I think with this amount and working with DBED, maybe we can reach some uh, entrepreneurs. Not doesn't have to be all over the United States, but even within the state of Maryland, there's an active venture capitalist community. We have a congressman that's a venture capitalist. We have, uh, and we need to find ways to reach those. And I'm not. It doesn't have to be. I'm not saying uh, we'll bring in Microsoft. But if we bring in some good sound investment of reputable firms, that will be the catalyst that will get other people to invest. So I'm going on, but I think that we need that whether we build a stadium, whether we don't, whether we have a baseball team, whether we don't. But, 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 I, but what's always so hard is number one, to get the, RF, get the scope focused well enough, and then to hire the right firm and then to get the right firm to do the right work. And, and, and I, I know that's not easy, and I know I'm telling you all it's obvious, but so I, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, that, that, that this is a good start. I guess I'd like to see the RFP when it's ready, you know, and, and that sort of thing. It is in your. Oh, okay, I, I'll, I'll look at it. The, the, this precise one we're going to use? Because I, did, I didn't take that's it as the that. Draft. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, but that, that's uh, the direction uh, I think we want to go, and we need to know uh, there's, there's an effort here to say what we're going to get back, and, and um, I think uh, it's been a difficult situation, but I think if, if we're going through this, it will, if, if we go to the state for money, for a stadium, wherever it might be, um, then, you know, we're going to need to argue that we we're carrying through on this is what I would say. The idea is to come up with eight at least right. capitalist well, projects or as many as eight, yeah. one of which I'm assuming will be a stadium I, somewhere I, in the sustainable community uh, area. I, I, I guess I worry identified. a little bit about that approach because it's like it's picking specific objectives rather than looking at how the how we can do that. If well, you know, truly, examples. my goal is that mm -hmm. within six months, we're going to have this decided. Mm -hmm. Because I can guarantee you six front, months from now, I don't want to have this albatross still around my neck, quite frankly. We're going to have made a decision, mm -hmm. uh, or the sons will have made their decision about whether to stay or go. Okay. And, uh, you know, we are shooting at a moving target, folks. <laughs> So, uh, and it's trying, it's like trying to catch an eel. You know, it's, it's pretty slippery. Uh, if it were easy, I'm sure we would have come to an agreement already. 
I, I empathize with your frustration, Mr. Metzner, because uh, I can understand why you don't feel like you have any information, and the, the fact is there's really no information to provide, and it is frustrating. I want to I want to commensurate a deal as soon as possible, and as soon as uh, Bruce Quinn and the Sons realize that Fredericksburg is not the place to go, uh, then I believe affecting a deal will be even better. And if, if it it's comes to uh, the time where we have to look for other teams to occupy either our existing stadium or a brand new stadium, wherever we decide to build it, then we can cross that bridge when we get to it too. But uh, I just want everyone to know that uh, there really is nothing to update folks on about the stadium. The main issue we have is how can we pay for it? And until and unless there's more of a private sector uh, contribution to financing this project, it cannot happen. So uh, we're, we're working on that. Um, other than that, I don't have anything to tell you. Is there any other feedback on the RFP as it is? Because yeah, this uh, is just a draft. Just make one comment. Sure. Um, to the extent that it's possible, and I don't know how to do it, you guys can figure it out. I do think that we ought to involve the EDC in this. The EDC has taken a particular interest in downtown Hagerstown now that, to the best of my knowledge, they've never had. So they're anxious to be involved in this issue. But in addition to that, their decisions now and in the future are going to greatly affect the county commissioner's funding and other aspects of what the county commissioners do. And to the extent that EDC is uh, part of the process, they can also be part of uh, finding the resources to make things happen as well. I don't think we should be ignoring the EDC when they have a real interest in trying to help downtown Hagerstown. Would it be possible to send them a draft of the proposal to get their feedback, maybe in the executive committee or something? or? Would you recommend the EDC as a whole, or? Well, I mean, start with the executive committee, and right. they can make those decisions. And this is not, there's no confidential information in here or anything, so. I think that's, I mean, I have no problem with getting that kind of feedback before we go ahead and put this out. If there's any way we can improve this product, that's just fine with me. Any other questions or concerns? Uh, I, I, I do, and I'm gonna follow uh, on, on Lou a little bit. Uh, on this notion that, that we're going to create this plan uh, for implementation and action for downtown uh, and, and leave this uh, discussion of a stadium linger uh, for another six months, uh, which I know will be another nine months and, and, and beyond that. Um, uh, and I'll say the same thing I've said the last six weeks, you know, if, if I mean, that, that discussion has to happen. That, that, that issue has to be resolved. Uh, you know, this council is never going to come to conclusion on uh, the basic premise of location, which uh, generally uh, impacts uh, heavily this notion of private investment. Uh, and there's just no real way, uh, you know, and I think the clear message has been to separate them. Um, and, and, and here we sit, you know, three months uh, after receiving, you know, a, a follow-up report and, 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 and we haven't uh, taken any action. Uh, in, in fact, uh, to some degree, you know, I, I think it, it, it hamstrings um, efforts uh, to to proceed and, and progress on other on other initiatives. And I just don't I don't understand what point we do get to where where that occurs. Do, do we get to the end of this plan and, and we get to the end of, of, of the EDC's uh, central city or city center committee? Uh, and, 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 and the issue then uh, be brought forward for, for, for some type of resolution. 
I mean, we're, we're talking uh, about at least two other projects right now uh, in that vicinity that, that, that some folks want to link to it uh, in some manner. Um, and, and we're talking about those other things in some roundabout manner to, to the, this, this larger subject that, that we're having no discussion on. Uh, and, and, you we're know, actually and discussing it right now. Well, point. <laughs> we're, we're discussing it to the degree that two members are sitting here saying we want it on the agenda. Uh, you know, uh, to, well, to what we have is a situation where three people at this point don't have, there is no consensus for three we, on any particular You don't location. get to that point unless you have a public discussion about it. Uh, and, 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 and you don't have a public discussion about it until it's actually put forward uh, to have. Um, and, 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 you know, and so, so we, we, we get to read things about it, we, we get to, to, to make comment about it, um, and, and we get inferences about it, but, and, and the public is, is left as, as, as lost as, as, you know, some of us are uh, on the issue. And, you know, I, I don't understand how, how, how that's the, the, the uh, successful way to go about that and, and come to resolution. I, I just, the, the, there are a lot of folks out there that, that, that have tons of, of, of positions on it that, you know, uh, and they're the only ones that, that, that have uh, the discussion about it. Uh, I think that, that when you look at this, this downtown plan, and I've said it to staff, and I've said it in, in, in things that I've sent out, um, you know, I, I think that downtown is a, is a, is a larger priority. Uh, you know, of, of, of this broader area and what we have at the moment is, is about 20% of our buildings that, that are doing well and functioning well. Uh, we've got about 50% that are in this state of transition and we've got about 30% that, that, that are in complete failure. Um, and while we uh, appear to work on the, this, uh, this approach of figuring out how to take corrective action on the 30% uh, in failure, um, we do so at the peril of watching the 50% the, the, the in transition continue uh, to decline. So, so, I mean, I think that that's, you know, if that's the approach, uh, I think it would, would bode well at the end of the day. Um, but I, I don't know how you get there without resolution of, of the 800-pound gorilla in the room uh, that, that, that nobody seems to want to, to bring resolution to. Well, I, again, I, I think the 100,000 can be used for implementing plans for economic assessments with or without the, the stadium. I think it can, can go forward. I think the, it has to. the, the nitty problems are there. Um, you can do, agree or disagree about whether a stadium project would help them or not help them, uh, but there's, there's still the fundamental problems are going to be there either way. And things like this now, uh, the, when I was talking about the bones, I, I apologize. I didn't see the heading that it was actually the proposed RFP. I thought it was a draft for us to read, so I apologize on that. But I was speaking of the bones, but sections A and B, you know, uh, again, I'm going back to the agenda item here. Um, I, I think uh, if, I'll try to work on A and B a little bit more because it just occurs to me we need a bit more outreach emphasis on that and maybe. Uh, and maybe I'll talk some more w with you all. So I apologize for that. But no, uh, I think. But, but you know, I'm trying to come to grips with something. I don't about think we're doing, we're not doing effective because I, I agree with all the other council members how to make this actually work, and effective, and not just a document you put on a shelf is the key question here. And I know we all have that. And and I don't think we're doing yeah. a thumbs up, thumbs down on this particular yeah. draft so. right now. I think what I would like is, I mean, is 10 days enough for the, yeah. why don't we say two weeks from now? Uh, we'll come back, we'll try to get the EDC feedback. Uh, in the meantime, if council members have uh, edits that they'd like to propose, then please send them to, who wants to be the primary contact, Jill? Certainly. Okay. So send them to Jill. Uh, who, will you also reach out to the EDC? Okay, thank you. Any other stakeholders we Definitely want to get feedback on this proposal. Certainly, it's 
part of the public record, so, uh, okay, the downtown alliance, okay. And it is a public document, it's part right, of our so packet. So. We welcome all the feedback. Any other questions, comments on this particular item? Okay, moving on, thank you. Mr. Brubaker, you have a suggested legislative action request. Right, it, uh, basically I'm um, just requesting that we do the formality. Uh, I briefed you all in June on the double taxation issue. I can go through it again if people want. Uh, but um, I think the key thing here, as I put in my memo, is regardless of what each jurisdiction does with their counties, it, it puts a legal backbone. People may choose to do nothing, keep their current things, but it gives the municipalities a legal backbone for the first time in addressing this issue. And so I would request that the, the council not a consensus so the mayor can sign a form that says that we agree with the recommendations. This would be sent to MML so yeah. that they can go to this, uh, the legislature. Right, right. Absolutely. And so, I, and so, the, uh, so I can work with the legislative committee to move this forward. And, and we also need to commend Martin on this. He's Absolutely. put a lot of time and effort and hours into this and not just as a representative of us but as a leader and it's on a statewide level on this issue and thank you. Indeed. Good here, here, Marty. Good work, yeah. Marty. So is that a thumbs up from everybody? Good. Okay. Thank you very much. At this point, we will do city administrators' comments. None, none for me this evening. We're not supposed to. Oh, yes. Council members, Mr. Munson. I'm pleased to say that uh, I've been attending municipal concerts each week, and they're growing, and they're growing. And the seats are incredibly popular, and they're looking for more next year. Indeed, I just have to say, I went last night, I was riding my bike and walked my bike through City Park and uh, heard them practicing Did at the band show last night. And even in practice, they sounded really good. Yeah. And people were hanging around, and one lady actually complimented on how much they liked the seats and the handicap accessibility, too. So. Mr. Alshire. I have a, a comment. Uh, from the EDC meeting uh, this past week. Um, the letter that went out, the letter of support from the EDC. And let me just preface this. You know, I sent out an email. And the heading of the email says, I think these letters of support are an important part of reaching out to the team ownership, identifying private business community support for this venture. Nothing in that email of opposition to that letter going out. And as I told the EDC, I wasn't opposed. I was fine with the letter. But in that process of comments, what I expressed to the EDC as my concern is this. In that meeting, they indicated that the letter went through several meetings of the, the EDC Executive Committee, that it went to the Board of County Commissioners for review and their sort of blessing, and that it went to all voting members of the EDC for their uh, comment and, and, and concurrence. But it never was sent via courtesy to the mayor and council in that sort of three week duration in which it was vetted uh, by that entity, which I found odd given that we are the public entity that's going to assume the, the significant debt uh, on the project. And uh, the EDC expressed that it was sent to the city, that the city was represented at the executive committee meetings. So I'm just trying to figure out as the ex officio to the EDC, I mean, I saw the letter for the first time an hour before it was delivered. So at what point did we have comment on this letter? I can tell you I attended one meeting of the executive committee uh, where I was handed a draft 
the, the final version, which ended up, and I gave no feedback on it, uh, the final version I saw was very different than that draft, which is what I got on my desk, I think, probably the same time you got yours. So uh, as far as input from the city, that's as far as I can say, at least from this person, uh, the input that I gave. I'm not sure if any staff had any input, but as far as I know, that's all the input that we had. You're right, I don't think they did. I mean, did any other council member, uh, was any other council member aware of the final draft? So, so nobody else saw it until we see it an hour before it goes out. And I'm just, I, I, I'm, I find it interesting that, you know, and I, I've been a participant of the EDC for a long time, that as the ex officio member, one of them, to the EDC, this is the first time I can recall that, that it was sent out, or something of that type was sent out just to the voting members. Or that the, the elected official as an ex officio to that board you know, isn't given the courtesy of, of, of a simple review, or at least an awareness uh, you know, uh, of it. And, and again, I, I hearken back to my comments clearly which were, were not of opposition uh, to it, you know, so, so, you know, if there was this purpose of uh, a, a exclusion, it was certainly uh, uh, and obviously misplaced. Anything else? I just reiterate my comments. I'd, 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 I'd love to see a discussion by this body uh, of the stadium. Duly noted. Mr. Brubaker. Yes, um, I want to uh, thank the uh, police chief, McColtsman, for his very professional presentation to the Chamber of Commerce and other folks on Wednesday morning. Uh, I think he, he did a very professional job. I don't think it was well, uh, well bannered in the local media because he stressed how well, how they're coping with issues that all municipalities in the state have, such as drugs and gangs. And may I once again iterate that he put a chart up that in terms of violent crime per capita, Hagerstown is right there with Frederick and Annapolis. And there are several cities, I won't mention them, that are our size that are much larger than us. Not to say that we don't have problems, that we don't have to try to deal with them, but we are far from the worst place to live in terms of violent crime in this state. That was part of his presentation. Did, was that in the paper? No. Not it to was mention drugs and gangs. Not to mention that when a and convenience so, store on the corner of Washington and Nottingham I understand. Gets downtown. Downtown. it's but, but, considered but, but, a downtown but, convenience store. They say store. you shouldn't. It's not even close. And, and I didn't That's mean true. to start this out as, as, as a criticism. The journalist, it's just very unfortunate because he did such a very professional presentation with lots of, and I wish. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, a lot more people could see it, and maybe we should make sure it's available on, you know, various media outlets that he could see his presentation. I, uh, I think, believe, believe it was recorded. I also want to thank uh, Comptroller uh, Francho for being in the area, uh, both in the city and uh, events around the city on Wednesday. Uh, he was very active in recognizing local citizens and local businesses at various events. And um, um, his recognition of our community and interest in our community, as expressed in several of his addresses, is, is appreciated. Um, and um, uh, a person very unknown, the new uh, uh, acting director of the I-81 Corridor Coalition, trying to get the states together to further transportation all up and down 81, transportation of all types, not just highway traffic, and try to find ways to solve the problems through this, those eight states. And uh, we had a good meeting with, uh, with staff and, and um, uh, uh, getting to know him, uh, I, I think he might be able to work with uh, officials that can uh, deal at a higher level than just the technical folks and try to get some things together. So I, I hope that has some uh, some promise for the future. And um, just generally, I hope people are enjoying a wet but cool summer. <laughs> Can't complain about the rain. 
Mr. Metzner. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Bruce, I'm assuming we're soon getting to resurfacing road time. Right yeah. yeah, and, and uh, I want to commend the city. Uh, it's obvious we're getting there. My neighborhood actually has a road that's getting done, so the sidewalks, the sidewalks are getting done. And I have to commend uh, my neighborhood has had a street tree problem for a long time, so now it's getting addressed and uh, it's being addressed very professionally, very well. And one understands the expense when you see what goes on in one little neighborhood of how many sidewalks we're repairing because of street tree damage that uh, we really do incur. And uh, I have to say, because I've been, I voiced more than one time that uh, we put, quote, the proper trees in my neighborhood and the sidewalks are still buckling. It has become apparent from talking to city staff who know what they're doing that they actually did put the right trees in, but there are certain places if your yard is filled with rock, it, uh, that's still going to cause problems. So I just wanted to commend everybody in doing that and uh, agree with Martin. Hope everybody's having a good summer. Thank you. Ms. Nye. Um, National Night Out, I guess, was a success. I know that um, the rest of the hot dogs were given to the Police Athletic Club for the kids that they've brought in <coughs> and I, probably they've got over 70, more than 70 now, that um, they've taken under their wings. Hopefully that will continue to grow as well because we certainly do need that. And um, again, as I said here, and I hear stadium, and I hear stadium, and I hear stadium, I really would like it to be sooner than later to be brought on agenda and to soon get something started. I really would. You know, I'm just tired of it. I, I really am. I'm tired of the playing back and forth with Fredericksburg, with what Quinn has to do. I think that we just need to move forward and go ahead and get it done so that we can t continue to do what we need to do. So thanks. we have three votes. I think that we need to move it. Okay, then the, I also wanted to thank uh, specifically Officer Kendall for spearheading the National Night Out. I personally couldn't attend, but I heard it was a success. It was very good. Yeah, and, um, yeah it was very well done. It's a, a wonderful event that's held nationwide, and uh, I'm glad that we are participating in that. And uh, with that, let me um, entertain a motion to go into executive session for we have two uh, items to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, etc of employees, appointees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, and to consult with legal counsel to obtain legal advice regarding the MELP demolition. Is there a motion to go into executive session? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll, I'll, so move, uh, I'll second the motion. Second. Is there any discussion? I am opposed to item number two in executive session. Um, I'm not sure why Item number two is in executive session. I'll say two things. I'm not going to vote against it. However, if it's to receive legal advice on the issue of eminent domain or condemnation in general, I don't know why our citizens shouldn't hear what that legal advice is versus legal advice of how to negotiate this particular situation. So the example being if a lawyer is asked to discuss the law of divorce is one thing, if he's asked to discuss your case, it's another. I, my anticipation is that we're going to probably hear what we've heard in the past, and that is how the process works. Having said that, I don't mind going to the executive session because I'll say it right now, I've said it again. Uh, I know there's three votes to put this up at the next meeting, and I'm going to vote for eminent domain slash condemnation. It, as soon as it's brought up. So we can discuss uh, whatever everybody wants to discuss in executive session tonight. I don't mind it, but I can't conceive that my position is going to remotely change on that issue. Um, when I do want to let everybody know that we will have it on our work session for next Tuesday, the MELP. Um, so we will be following up with the public discussion. As the second, uh, um, uh, I, I think I, I'm still still germane for me to comment. I, I would be willing to be 
brief in open session on the facts of eminent domain pro and con, but I don't, I, I don't see how we can keep the city, protect the citizens and protect the city discussing our negotiating position in open session. That's just like telling, you know, going in to buy a car and, 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 and giving your maximum price or buying a house and saying ahead of time what your terms are. You can't do it. But I, I would be willing to hear an open session so the citizens can understand the, the briefing on eminent domain if the maker of the motion agreed to that. But I, I don't think it's appropriate to discuss the actions we take as a result of that. I'm, I think Mr. Brubaker and I feel the same way. I mean, that's that's my thought. So uh, I don't know if the, I didn't know if that was your dividing point or not. Uh, yeah, that was my only issue. Uh, I mean, uh, I understand um, negotiations. Uh, I just didn't think we needed negotiations. No, I don't, I don't see how we can right. do that and legitimately protect the citizens of Hagerstown. No problem with that. Any other discussion? All right, we'll call for the vote. All in favor of going into executive session, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Is that four to one? Do we have any non-voting? So you're with. No, I just didn't okay. My voice didn't All right. Sorry, Penny. I'm like an auctioneer. I have to. <laughs> yes, we're going to take a five-minute break before we go into executive session. Thanks. <laughs>